Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Nakifa bernard Garay. I'm holding this microphone for recording purposes, but if you can't hear me in the back, just give me a wave. Um, I'm here representing the Joseph C. Cornwall Center at Rutgers University, Newark, along with Dr. Charles Payne, the director of our center. And today we're going to talk to you about school discipline disparities in New Jersey, particularly exclusionary discipline. Exclusionary discipline is discipline that removes learners from school climate, school environments, particularly out of school suspension and expulsions. Um, this is an equity issue for a number of reasons. And just to engage y'all a little bit, any sort of uh, hints as to, or uh, ideas as to why this is an issue we should be paying attention to. Exclusionary discipline specifically out of school suspensions and expulsions. Loss of, learning. Loss of learning. Loss of learning time specifically, right? Any Anything else? Disengagement from the academic setting, exactly. Um, just want to say, so before we get too far in the discussion, I just want you to know who Nikifa is. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and she just, she's only been with the, Cornwall Center since May, and she's really, she's made an impact. Let me just put it there. I mean, she's changed the quality of our work in many ways. But anyway, just some background. Uh, eight years of experience in New Jersey's nonprofit community development industry, most recently program officer at Local Initiative Support Corporation, um, working with government nonprofits and resident leaders before that a fundraiser in Patterson, New Jersey, for the New Jersey Community Development Corporation. Uh, Alumna of Cook College, uh, Bachelor of Science, Environmental Policy, Institutions of Behavior, and the Blaustein School for her Master's in Public Policy. She's now doing her PhD in Global Urban Studies, also at Rutgers, and the title of her dissertation, and boy, this is a Newark dissertation. Uh, the title of her dissertation is Capacity, Strategies, and Processes of Civic Engagement Among Community Development Nonprofits, a Newark, New Jersey case study. Uh, she's of proud Trinidadian descent, I am. Uh, <laughs> and, and I happen to know her family was close to the family of Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture, which is an interesting historical, interesting historical fact, and a proud resident of Newark, New Jersey, and now you mentioned it. Thank you. So, thank you so much. As Dr. Payne said, I, I'm not an education scholar. I'm, community development is my wheelhouse, but as the mayor spoke about today in his keynote, um, co the strength of our education systems reflect heavily on the strength and the resources of our communities and neighborhoods. So I'm very excited to be working on issues of education now that I'm at the Cornwall Center. So we were talking a little bit about the different um, equity issues related to, um, out, ex, uh, excuse me, exclusionary discipline practices. And many of you named some of, some of the reasons. Lost instructional time. When students are not in school, they're simply just not available and there to absorb what's, what's going on. And one of the greatest predictors of academic engagement is the opportunity to learn. So if you don't have the opportunity to learn, the engagement with the academic institutions aren't there. Pretty, uh, pretty logical uh, piece there. Decreased student engagement, as Shaki mentioned earlier lower academic performance over time, decreased sense of belonging and inclusion, reduced graduation rates and increased uh, probability of dropout, mental health and socioeconomic issues, and increased likelihood of contact with the juvenile justice system. One study showed that uh, students that were suspended for minor offense or out of school suspensions for minor offense were three times more likely to engage with the juvenile justice system in the subsequent year. So these aren't, um, while it may seem just uh, a, a, a quick uh, solution in schools to remove some, someone that might be seen as problematic, it actually has a much more uh, longer term deleterious effect on individuals and our communities overall. Particularly the school to prison pipeline, which we just sort of talked about. Um, but when we exclude students from school, they lose the opportunity to engage academically, which decreases in achievement increases our, their opportunity, excuse me, increases the likelihood of dropout and increases their probability of contact with the juvenile justice system or delinquency. And this was presented in a talk by Russell Skiba in 2017 at the uh, ERA conference, which is an academic um, conference for education research. 
So what do we know about exclusionary discipline nationally? We know that marginalized students are the most likely to be excluded from school as a disciplinary practice. In particular, black students, students in the LGBTQ population, preschool students, believe it or not, boys, Latinx males. Black and Hispanic students are more likely to be punished for subjective offenses. An example of that would be um, being a sus uh, suspended for loitering or uh, attitude, being loud, right? Whereas their white counterparts would be suspended for things like smoking or um, uh, fighting, more, much more objective uh, behaviors. And this differential treatment is noticed by students and teachers. You know, I think students, young people are much more perceptive than the rest of us. They get the vibes quickly. And what this does is that it creates a lack of trust between the students and the teachers, the students in the administration, and can actually uh, cause a disengagement with their school community and their school climate. Suspension leads to increased negative behavior by the suspended students in the future. So one might think that if a student is suspended, it will reduce the behavior in the future. It actually studies show that that's not necessarily the case, that students don't, uh, students don't become less disruptive when they become suspended. And there's little evidence that suspension makes schools safer. There was a study in Chicago that uh, looked at a public school that was, uh, that had a high use of out of school suspensions and they used at school data and attitudinal surveys for teachers and students and those with higher, uh, th those schools with higher out of school suspensions actually had lower safety ratings perceived by both students and faculty. So I mentioned earlier preschool students in 2017-18, a little over 2,800 preschool students uh, received one or more out-of-school suspensions. Black and preschool students accounted for 18.2% of total preschool enrollment, but received 43% of out-of-school suspensions. So they received more than twice their share of out-of-school suspensions as a preschooler than their population within the, within the group uh, being observed. And for all schools in the United States, and this is data collected by the Department of Ed, the Civil Rights Data Collection, uh, black students represent 15% of enrolled students, but account for 38% of students who have received an out-of-school suspension. That's more than two times their share of the population. They're receiving more than two times the punishment. Latinx students represent 27% and actually only account for 21% of out-of-school suspension. So there's some uh, hopeful data there that they are receiving less than their share. Black girls received in-school suspension at a rate of 11% and at a rate of 13, uh, at 11% for out-of-school suspension and, thir excuse me, black girls represented 11% of in-school suspensions and 13% of out-of-school suspensions, but only represent 7% of the population. So they're receiving twice their proportion of out of school suspensions. And then finally, black boys, they received 20% of out of school, excuse me, they received 20% of in school suspensions and 24% of out of school suspensions, but they only represent 7%. That last number I think is the most alarming. 24% of out of school suspensions go to black boys and they only make up 7%. That's more than three times their share of the population, that they're receiving um, these terrible um, practices with respect to discipline. In 2017, when we look at students with disabilities, they make up 13% of the population nationally of student enrollment, but they receive 20, almost 25% of out-of-school suspensions. That's a great question. And I think we can, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you specifically what this study accounts for that reason, but I'd imagine that when I think about my experiences in schools, removing a student that is hard to handle, or if um, a teacher isn't capable of keeping a certain sense of order, it potentially might um, 
cause the, the simple solution to be remove them so the rest of us can learn. And if, some, if a student has a disability, whether it be social or emotional or anything else that makes it harder, perhaps, I'm speculating here. So isn't this when the CST and the um, psychologists and uh, physical therapy and all the other teams that's there on account of the students with disability, I work in the school system, mm -hmm. and I know that, that we are not allowed to suspend students with special needs unless it gets to a point of no control or they trying to harm themselves or other. Mm -hmm. But I see several schools like if a child is running in a hallway or a child is doing something that they shouldn't be doing automatically do suspend them. Shouldn't it be, be against the law? <coughs> that's a good start. <laughs> Would you mind, do you mind? No, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be using this. Uh, do you mind saying what school system? I work for New Public Schools. Oh, you're, you're, you're from here yes. in Newark, that's fine. I'm a community engagement specialist. Yeah. E excellent. I've been thinking a lot in, in, in the last year, uh, some of it in connection with my colleague back there, uh, Dr. Marianne Raleigh from the Office of Teaching and Learning, about the issue of student dignity. All right? And I'll be saying something about that at, uh, I'm doing the lunch talk. But one of the things that I, that I have learned to appreciate more in the last year that, and I should have known it before as, as a teacher, that a lot of the discipline, a lot of the times when teachers think students are misbehaving, students think they are fighting for their dignity, right? And they find schools to be places where their dignity is not acknowledged, right? And I think that cuts across race, it cuts across disabilities. The students with disabilities are often the people who are looked down upon by everybody. Right, so they have a special fight to stand up for their worth, right? And when they do that, some teacher's gonna say, you're out of line, you're being defiant, blah, blah, blah. That's a hypothesis, right? Uh, and, we, and this is part of an ongoing study. This is our first crack at no, publicly available data. It's like the black bell over students with special needs uh -huh. students. Okay. It's, it's like, a, it's like a, the black, like they invisible. So uh -huh. it's, it's true. What you trying to say is the special needs kids uh -huh. is like kind of dividing regular things. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my daughter. Ah, she very has, good. She has special needs. Very glad you're here. So, like the regular kids see them and they like pick at them, so they basically divide it with the regular kids. Did everybody hear what she said? The regular kids look at the students with disabilities and they pick at them. Right? They pick at them. Right? There's, I mean, there's just so much in that box. We have a, this is my time now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> she, 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 she's running the show here. Um, let me say, for, I don't like the term discipline, right? It, it feels like a prison term. Yeah. It feels like something you do to people. I don't like that term, right? The bigger conversation that we need to be moving toward is a conversation about how do we get everybody in school communities acting in a more civil supportive way. And that's everybody, that's parents, teachers, mm -hmm. students, and, and everybody. But the discipline thing is a part of it that's right in our face, right? And we know there are all kinds of injustices going on in the name of, of, of discipline, and all kinds of just plain out ineffective education going on in the name of discipline. So I wanna say that, but I also wanna say I don't even know if, if we're gonna have time to be talking about this, right? I think there are just two, two things I wanna say. What she opens up about the way students treat other students is a more concern to me and sometimes than the way teachers treat students, yeah. right? It, and the power in that. I don't know if you guys know what Robert Taylor Holmes was in Chicago. It's one of the worst environments, the projects, right? One of the worst environments of human beings. I was a friend of mine, and I, we, do, we were doing a youth group there. And one of the things that I have done in my career that has had the most powerful impact is we told students, you will not curse at one another. You curse us out, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it, right? We're not gonna have you put each other down. We're gonna not have any more hiking on, on each other. We're not gonna have any more sounding on each other. And if we catch you doing that, we're gonna go off on you. What you doing with us, we're grown, right? but we're not going to have you disrespecting each other. The things I have done in, 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 in my career, I don't think anything, one thing I've done 
did as much to change the policy of, the, of, of, of a program. We hope later in this year to have a presentation from Brotherhood Sister Soul in New York, a wonderful youth empowerment pro program in New York City. The last I knew, and forgive my language, their language is that once you walk on our grounds, you are not allowed to say nigger, bitch, or hoe. Those are only terms to the grade. They have no other purpose, right? And when you're here, you're going to respect each other. So anyway, I'm going to say, and, and, and I won't, probably won't have, I'm going to be talking about freedom schools a lot. You probably won't get to say this. Well, maybe I'll sneak it in <laughs> now. Sisters reminded me. I think some of the most powerful things a freedom school does is change the way kids support other kids, right? Uh, and, and, and so I just want to put that on the agenda that that is awful, that's crucial. And if we're going to go to healthier environments, we need to be thinking about that as well as well, how do we get teachers to behave in, in more supportive ways. Yes, sir. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed, I'm just a parent, not an educator. But, but don't uh, say just a parent. If, if, you work at a, if you work at a corporation or whatever, you've probably taken some type of training or some type of code of conduct policy that your company has. Think about the context of our schools. Most schools will have a code of conduct, but there's never any training attached to it for the students. It's an expectation that they follow it. But what we're not doing collectively is teaching these kids why treating someone differently is a problem. Giving them the annual or maybe even more frequency because they're kids training on how to treat people. And they raise that expectation so that once that is done, they can't really say, I didn't know. And that's what the standard adults are held to. Because you know, if you do something at work, if you call somebody out of their name or something like that, they say, the code of conduct which you sign states this. And you really have nowhere to go at that point. So perhaps it should shift more towards that type of environment for children on a more frequent basis because they are kids. Okay, please, go ahead. Yeah, but how does that disagree with this point? Like, is it accountable in the corporate world or in the workforce? Because it's really not the same system in the workforce. It's the same thing. Um, I would take state government for a while. They have the same disparities with black male uh, discipline problems. The state of Jersey workforce. It's, it's just a kind of rhetoric of, hey, we know the problem, we know the problem, but well, what are you going to do about it? And, um, what are you going to do? This disparity has been going on since I've been young, since I've had to do the same thing. Uh, okay, if black boys get suspended this time high. But what do you do about it? What are the systems in place? Um, these systems, they, they get to, to do it over and over again, whether it's in corporate America or within the school system. It's, it's, it's the same. Okay. Young man. So I think, um, so my only educational course, um, my time spent at Rutgers was based in African American studies. I was a review professor um, in our African department. Um, and I was privileged to take one um, African-American based education course in how we teach. And one thing I noted um, was not just for black people, but for folks across the board, is our pedagogy in our school system is really rooted in the idea of one another being less than. Uh, the student being less than teacher, the teacher being less than principal, um, and then the student of different economic statuses and race being less than one another in that one space. And thus, we can never have equalization of both education and scholarship when the teacher is pointing that out, and then the teacher's actively performing in the manner in which she's telling students that they're less than, but then she's raising certain students, he or she is raised for them, or raising certain students in classroom as graded in other students. And so if we're going to have a system of education that's equalized across the board, number one, we need to teach our students how to degrade one another, but we really need foundationally Need to teach our students that no one is greater than both the teacher, both the student, everyone is equal. And we need to, um, as bell folks would say, teach to really transgress and change that pedagogy when we're all educating one another in that space. And so, in order to go somewhere, we all must be fulfilled in that education. No one's actively partaken as a greater sense. Yeah, you started this so you can respond. <laughs> <laughs> I want to respond to the brother back there too. Okay, yeah, please. Part one of my statement was what I finally said. Part two is why are the disparities happening? And so in my town, we actually sued the Your town district. is uh, sorry, South Orange Bay Oh wonderful. Yeah. We actually my organization sued the school district for this very time. Hmm. And our goal was not necessarily, you know, to stop discipline to make it more transparent so we know why what's happening is happening. And part of that is to 
require teachers, staff, whoever is meeting out these discipline measures to have to record it and put it in a central location. So if teacher A happens to have five kids who got suspended in that, for that classroom activity, there's a pattern that starts to develop. So we start to target that teacher to say, so why is these kids? Why, that teacher? Right. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the problem with some of these statistics is that it never goes to the next step to say, why are these things happening? And then target those areas where the problems reside and then deal with them. Um, Our last slide covers some of that on what we can do locally. Well, but they're already, I think, beginning it. So I'm going to let this go for a minute, please. <laughs> yes. Oh, August Torres, North Alliance. Hello, everybody. Um, as uh, Afro Latina who fits most of these um, most of these data points, as somebody who is constantly constantly suspended from a predominantly white uh, elementary school growing up, as well as being expelled, once I once I went to un once I was an undergrad, I was deemed list for my entire college career. I'm but sorry, that you was were deemed list. But academically, through elementary school and high school. I was failing because I was constantly being suspended, constantly being held back, but it was it was from local programs and local mentorship that I found strength and I found confidence in myself in order to excel. And that's one of one of the beautiful things about Newark, being in Newark, is that we do have strong um, public pro programs that people can buy into that are free for, for our children, but it's a matter of bridging the gap between the programs that, are, that we do have available and in our schools. Gonna, so stop the conversation. The conversation is where we wanted this to go. Um, I, I'm going to stop it and put some New Jersey data into the conversation. Uh, some of it is actually new data, uh, uh, stuff we have not. Uh, this is the second time I guess we presented it. Um, and then I I thought we were going to have high school students in here, and I was going to ask them to reflect on the data against their experiences. But y'all are reasonably young <laughs> as an audience, so maybe you can. But and, and maybe you can. Uh, draw back on some of those. So, you gonna? Yep. Oh, oh, okay, fine. That's that, that's cool. Um, look, the short version of what I'm gonna say is that Nikifa gave you the national picture. All I'm gonna say about New Jersey is everything is worse in New Jersey, right? And again, N New Jersey's reputation as a high achievement state is reasonably well deserved, right? There's some stuff that are left out of the usual, but it's but it's, it is a high achievement state. It is also a highly segregated state. It is also a state that has some of the, 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 the country's strongest achievement gaps. It is also a state that has some of the greatest disparities and achievement, even though it has improved from where it was seven or eight years ago, as best, as best, any, as best anybody can figure. So again, just some basic facts about New Jersey. Um, uh, typically about 2% of, of students uh, uh, are going to be removed for uh, in, sus in school suspensions overall in the state, about 4% of students in most recent years. Uh, we are we're using pre-pandemic data for obvious reasons, I think, right? Because that just changes everything. About 4% of students so get suspended. Anywhere from 150,000 to 160,000 students a year get, get, get dinged. And go ahead. If you look, now remember when she said uh, the proportion nationally, the disproportion is bad? Well, hey, I was thinking, that ain't nothing. <laughs> come, come to New Jersey, you want to see bad. Remember she said that, that Hispanic students nationally are underrepresented in terms of who gets suspension? Well, they need to stay out of New Jersey, right? Because uh, you can see what's happening in, in, in New Jersey, right? So black boys, 8% of the population, but of those who get suspended, effectively a third, right? Uh, his Hispanic boys, 14% of the population, 21%, right? Substantially higher. Now that's a, that's 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 a that's a real change from the national pattern. Black girls, 8% of the population, 17% of, of of students. I, I'm not as smart as you think I am. <laughs> that's that's all right. You gotta remember my age, lady. Uh, uh, Okay, so you can go now. Uh, it is important to think about this in terms of not just how frequently different groups are getting suspended, but how many days. You can be suspended for one day or 20, right? Uh, and the days thing, it tells the same story in another way. Maybe it's even more depressing. That when you say for every 100 black boys, 
every hundred black boys, they're missing 55 days every year, right, of, of school. Um, compared bl to black girls, every hundred students missing 30 days of school per year. Go ahead. If you look at the, the English learning, English language learner students, we should have ELL there. At some ways, the, the raw data for the group as a whole looks relatively balanced, right? We can show you some slides earlier that will kind of complicate that. But at least this is one traditionally marginalized group, often a stigmatized group, often a new group in the country, in which the proportion of the population and the proportion of students receiving disability seems to be in balance, right? It is the opposite, again, to go back to your issue about students with disabilities, right? It is the same, it, it is the opposite for them. 20% of the, the state student population, but 35% of those receiving disability. And my impression, y'all will correct me if I'm wrong, while there is some ongoing conversation about race and ethnicity and disparity, I don't know that we have as much conversation about disability and disparity, right? And then, of course, there are the kids who are getting hit in both directions, right? Uh, okay. Um, you probably, can, I don't know if you can read this. We try to look at, since everybody expects that some teachers believe with complete sincerity, some principals believe with complete, that you have to suspend students. There's no way to run a city district with a lot of low-income districts unless, unless you do that. So two things about this slide. We wanted to look at some of the traditional Abbott districts. We wanted to look at the larger ones because that's a whole different dynamic. So let's say they had to have over 5,000. Um, and we wanted, and, and they're Abbott districts, so they're all going to have more than 50% economically poor. A part of what's striking about this is that if you look at the statewide, for New Jersey, suspension is, is about 3% of all students are going to be suspended for Camden is, and I should say, publicly reported data. Can we, is there any way to check the veracity of this data? Right now, we don't know that, right? So I'm just saying that. <laughs> these are the data that are on the state's websites. If these data are true, then Camden, East Orange, Elizabeth, Irvington, New Brunswick, Newark, Orange, Patterson, Perth Amboy, Union. If, if these data are true, all of those big low income districts are using suspension less than the state average, okay? Uh, and my guess is some of those are true, right? And some of those, there may be some, 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 some funny business. And if you look at it in another way, go back to days missed, part of what is striking, I wish I, I don't know why we left Atlantic City off this, but I know from memory that in Atlantic City, if you look at days missed per 100 students, it is 70, right? That was the largest we found, in, 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 and we didn't look at all districts in the state, but that was one of the largest we found, 70 days for every 100 students, right? And so you compare that to places like Bridgeton, 30, East Orange, 36, Elizabeth, 24, and then at the other end, uh, Orange City is five, Patterson is five, Plainfield doesn't suspend anybody, right? right? Union doesn't suspend. <laughs> so, again, part of what is important here, again, if, if, if these, if we can trust it, you don't have to do this, right? It, you, you, can, you can run a school system without high levels of suspensions if, 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 if uh, these are reliable data. That's why I do detention, lunch huh? detention. But then lunch detention turn out to be fun for them because they, don't want to leave Ms. Ruff office. <laughs> but I, it's, is that I, so bad? <laughs> you know, man, I keep telling no, I have to go. Like, even today, Ms. Ruff, can we come do lunch detention? Well, you're not on lunch detention, so you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, that's probably the best way we're going to hear today. Go, go ahead. Now, this is interesting, right? I and mean, we've kind of stumbled on this by accident. The darker the blue, the more kids are being suspended, right? That stuff is, is concentrated in southern New Jersey, right? And there are certainly some heavy blue uh, northern New Jersey district. But if this is all we have, it looks like the northern New Jersey districts 
uh, are relatively lighter in their rate of suspensions than some of the more or less rural districts, small town districts in the southern part of the state. So we don't know what that's about, but we're going to bring it to the attention of people and encourage somebody to look into it. Brother, you want a question on this particular? Yeah, it would, would one just assume it's because of hope? Um, I'm from a northern city, and, um, and in Inglewood, if you suspended a kid, the community found out, and you had some people's parents were lawyers and doctors, and it was like, not happening, not in this community. Um, versus the same the community right next to me, um, student, one of their seniors had literally all four years changed his grades because of Victorian um, in the school still let him graduate with that honor, with that degree. And we found out his um, grades were wrong, but they would not suspend him because his parents were wealthy and they were like, this is bad representation versus other cities that don't have the access to fight for their students so on the same level and have that wealth. In general, my, my sense about it, if you understand what goes on urban schools, knowing which parents have power is, is the first thing you need to know, right? right? These things, again, we didn't even know about this three or four months ago, so we don't have anything like that, even a guess. I have thought about two things. Some of these districts are districts in which the Hispanic population has ballooned in the last 10 years, right? And so one of the things that I think we should be worried about is whether or not some districts react to a new population by controlling it, and you control with suspension. That's that's a question. I don't, I don't mean it to be an accusation. Um, I'm from one of those districts, by the way. <laughs> one of those deep blue districts. I went, I, went, I went to school in one of them. Then the other thing that you can argue about South Jersey is that for everybody, Hispanic, white, black, standards for youth behavior are different in semi-rural areas. Right? I mean, I grew up in the community. You don't cut your eye at an adult. Y'all even know what that means? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, don't, you don't even look defiant to an right. adult, right? Oh, right? And so there are lots, some of this may be community sanctioned suspension, right? Uh, and, the, the, and community sanctioned suspensions could be very, very different from suspensions that are being, from the suspension that we're used to in other con. I, I don't know, but, the, but those are hypotheses and things we need to look into, please. Um, so I just want to say, and then I'm, I, I, I will stop and sort of turn it back, and, and I hope we can, we, we have all people with all kinds of experiences in the room, so I hope we can have a conversation about what do you think we should be thinking about to do better. Um, but I don't want to, I just want to say, I think we have a couple slides around the same thing. Segregation does not help, right? Uh, segregation just intensifies all the problems. So. If you uh, take all New Jersey high schools and divide them up into the mixed uh, um, non-segregated schools, which you're going to define as between 10 and 90 percent white and less than 50 percent economically disadvantaged, and then let's con contrast that primarily with the category number five. That's going to be the real, <laughs> the real deal here. 90 percent or more students of color, 50 percent or more economically a disadvantage. So the places in which race and poverty are concentrated, right? And guess what? It's worse than those places. So if we go to the next couple slides, uh, and the, the mixed non-segregated schools, about four or five percent of students are being suspended. And those schools characterized by both racial and class segregation, it's, it's double that, right? It is double that. Uh, the next slide says the same thing in a different way, but it makes it uh, another point. That the, the blue line under segregated economic, that suggests that in schools that are characterized primarily by economic segregation, there may be a tendency toward in-school in suspension, yes. your lunchroom, right? Uh, which is not as destructive long-term on, on students as out-of-school suspension, but when the school darkens, it goes back to out-of-school suspension. They go up. That's, that's a hypothesis that would be consistent with that. Something else we need to look into, please. Um, remember I was saying that, 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 that it looked like uh, English language learner students were not disproportionately affected. Here's a wrinkle on that, right? Suppose you look at schools where English learning students are concentrated, right? So if, if you look at the schools, um, uh, where they are between 5 and 20% of the population, 
you get a significant increase in out of school suspensions, right? Um, and again, that's not to say that the students who are being suspended are the English language learners. But it's, it is to say there's something about schools that have large populations that changes the way adults and students and I didn't put, hold that for, for, for one thought and look at the next slide. It's, it's kind of the same when you look at, at, at schools that have concentrations of students with disabilities. As they go up, the number of students suspended goes up and it goes up all the way to 13%. That's the highest number we've talked about yet, right? And again, it doesn't have to be that the students with disabilities are the ones being suspended, but it is something about schools in which these populations are concentrated that increases the likelihood of suspensions in those schools. Kind of relating to what this young lady said mm -hmm. earlier about the in and out group and the antagonization that happens between yeah. students without disabilities versus students with. It would be interesting to know how those two things played into this, mm -hmm. right? So I think those are, that was the last. Um, yeah. I just, do we have another? Some of these slides we can come back to at the end. Of, I want to have some conversation now. I just want to say about the uh, school to prison pipeline slide that for me, th there's a whole conversation that I hope you'll have right now about this issue of sometimes kids deserve to be put out. And that word deserved and what we mean by that, right? I, I would at least like to maybe think about some of that in the next, in the next few minutes we have. But in this line, school exclusion leads to these things. This is, I think, a very reasonable way to think about it. It's consistent with a lot of the data that we have. But just in terms of the impact that exclusion has, whether or not the kid deserves it, whether or not it's justified, I want a box, I want a line that goes from school, ex school exclusion straight out, and in the middle it would said sense of belonging, right? Because what you're telling kids is whether or not they belong in your community, whether or not they belong in your school. And it doesn't matter whether they, they hit somebody and say maybe they deserve it, right? It still changes their relationship, right? And as Nakifa said, we have good evidence that when you control for prior background factors, the fact of exclusion itself will lead to more bad behavior in the future, right? It's exactly the opposite of, of, of what we want. So that issue of sense of, of, of belonging, sense of being a member of a community, that is just so crucial, I want to underline it. A lot of this bad behavior comes from, it actually stems from the teacher. A lot of people don't realize that it comes from the teacher because when the teacher, this like a disrupted child, the teacher be the first one to say, oh, he need to be suspended, or he need to be sent home with his mom. Maybe his mom can do that. If a child keep, child going to school every day, is supposed to sit in front of this teacher that's supposed to be teaching them every day. If the child keep hearing the same message from that teacher that's supposed to be an uh, educator, that's supposed to speak positivity into that child, he's going to think that he don't belong. And I was, I had a conversation with my principal yesterday that we do a lot of cleaning up, not with the children, we do a lot of cleaning up with the adults because you have to redirect and recondition the adults on what to say, how to speak. But they went to school and got all this education, they already supposed to know. So if the adult not teaching the child right, maybe that adult needs to be removed. Before we start removing people. <laughs> okay. No, sometimes you do have to do that. Shake but, but, but I, I just want to underscore, before we go, I, I just want to underscore that I know absolutely there are teachers who believe in the deepest heart of hearts that what they are doing is good for the child. And they believe that, right? Uh, and so I think a lot of this is, is about adult education, yeah. right? And sometimes we have found in, in Chicago, where we did a lot of this, this, present the data to the teachers and then have the teachers talk to the students about the data. That can be very powerful. Uh, that you can change the way teachers and principals think about these things. But what I want to say is, think of it as an educational problem, but it, it's the education of adults that that's, that's. So I want, to, I want to continue, but before we do, we want some ground rules, right? Uh, I want you to give your name 
and, and if you think it's pertinent, something about what you're interested in, your teacher, parent, wh whatever, uh, just so you know, some of us could be resources to others of us if we kind of know what we want to, want to do. Dr. Riley, you want to start? Yeah. Hi, I'm Marianne Riley, I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning here at Public Schools. And well, first, thank you. Um, the whole idea of the figures that you have shared with us and the figures that you provided are stark. Um, and they and, and they help me to think about that I wonder if and, and this isn't about your topic but I wonder if the conversation needs to be about schools where dignity is the common where dignity is the focus it's not just something we do because it's social emotional That's learning cool. month or something like that but the school is designed to understand others Whatever other is, because the commonality when I look at the, the data that you are um, have provided us is that there's always othering going on, and uh, whether it's at a student to student level, it's at a teacher to student level, parent and teacher level, whatever the dynamics are. If schools are purposely designed where dignity is the central tenet of the school, then you don't need the staff development days where someone's going to learn about dignity. That the actual school is built so that everyone in the school under, it's the norm to be dignified. It's the norm to see other as, as potentially interested as opposed to threatened. Yeah. Um, I just think that I, I appreciate that this is obviously a huge, huge problem. But I also think it's a symptom of something that is, in fact, correctable, mm -hmm. and, and in fact has to be correctable. Um, Dr. Payne and I have talked um, frequently about building schools, not like later on you get to the dignity, but that you start with that as a central tenet. And it just strikes me that that's a worthy experiment for your public schools to take on. Um, to do it in a, in a way that it can be studied and, and added to so that um, I, I, I don't doubt for a minute if that was the central tenet. This, this wouldn't even be the conversation because people would never say a child at, at, at just so the preschool stuff, they completely flipping out, that a child at any age deserves to do what we know is psychologically damaging, and that is when you say to somebody, you no longer, you already feel like you don't belong. And now we just say, hey, you don't belong even more. It just, it's such obviously wrong to do it. So I'd like to, you know, I'm curious with the rest of the group, how, how does, like, how do we begin to, I guess I probably maybe should know this, but I, but I don't. Like, so how do we begin to have a shift in conversation, if, 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 if you agree, uh, around dignity. Wait, I want to get the brother back there. He had spoken and then we'll come back to you. Uh, how y'all doing? My name is Brian Mayer Brown from the Street Academy. Um, so as I'm listening, I'm listening to, uh, I'm listening to a few things. I mean, it's for recording purposes. I'm listening to, I'm listening to a few things, but the, the common thing that we're talking about is discipline, right? And that discipline, suspension should be the last resort. Right, there's no other disciplines taking place before that. It's just suspension, right? But what about the progressive discipline, right? How do you teach them if you just whooping them? Because then it's gonna go back to the same thing, the whole design of a school system, period. It's the design of the school. It's, the, it's gonna take you back centuries, like, yo, whoop them. It's gonna take you back to parenting, whoop them, right? So it's the discipline that's taking place. So what happens with as she was talking about earlier, the teachers, the staff. We have to change that mindset first in order to change the mindset of the young person because then that means we're not even talking to them. We're making decisions for them without talking to them. We don't understand what's going on in their mind because we're adults, so we assume that we know. But we don't because we, even have, we haven't even heard them out. So I keep listening to, when you look at the school to prison pipeline, they miss the part. It's home to prison pipeline. They skipping the parts. Right, because before they get to school, think about it, before they get to school, they're going through stuff at home first before they even get there. So before I go to school, let me smoke. 
Before I go to school, let me put my headphones on. Let me listen to the music that calms me down before I even walk in the building. But when I walk in the building, there's so many things going on at home, I can't focus on English, writing, reading, math, social studies, so I can't focus on any of that. The teacher doesn't even understand us because the social emotional aspect, they, that's not their job, right? So they don't wanna teach that part. It gets deeper than what we can imagine, right? So then we just say what? Whoop them, discipline. Nah, it's bigger than that. But we could get further peace. So I actually don't know if this is on the key for Oh, OK. Um, so Shaki, um, I work in public policy. Um, and I am a senior at Rutgers University in Newark. Um, studying political science intersecting with African American studies. And thus, I think the biggest issue um, to really bridge the gap between what you both just said is the pedagogy of our institutions at this moment in time and what the institution seeks to do. Um, and so if we look at the design structure of schools, design structure of public schools in particular, um, were designed with the whiteness in mind and really didn't include black and brown bodies until we started integrating schools um, in the 70s, the 60s, um, and, and that integration push. And so we had to adapt to black and brown people being in spaces which the institution was never designed for them to be in that space to begin with. We had our own type of teaching method, i.e., community schools, i.e. freedom schools, i.e. Um, these schools in which black people could relate to other black people, Latinx people can relate to other Latinx people in a way in which um, was culturally appropriate um, and sensitive enough that we understood each other's problems because we were both carrying those problems from the street to the school. Now that we're talking about this inclusivity issue of having a bunch of people coming to one space and having different ethnic, cultural, social, economic um, issues come into place, number one, schools were never designed to dignify students. If we look at the layout of how schools work, um, primarily, and I think this is, a lot of people don't understand this, but the idea of going to the bathroom, when a student has to ask for permission to go to the bathroom and then have to have that permission granted to them to use the bathroom, that is a, a, a construction in which I'm owning you. Uh, unlike the higher education system where in college, if you need to use the restroom, you get up and you walk out, but in your mind, you come back because you are now valuing your education where you only have to use the restroom. When someone's controlling you, you go to the bathroom and you stay in that bathroom longer of time because you're not being controlled in that moment. And so we start to look at those little things and how we're designing schools and change that in a way in which students coming to a place and they're, humified, they're human. They're, di they're dignified and they're valued as equalized. Where the teacher is saying, you need to use the restroom, get up, go, and I'm trusting you to go to the bathroom. I'm now gonna come back to the place in which I'm being valued. I'm gonna come back into the classroom and not go do stupid stuff in the hallway versus you telling me I'm not gonna allow you to use the bathroom and I get that opportunity to go, I'm gonna go do crazy stuff in the bathroom. I'm gonna go stupid stuff in the bathroom. So if we start to look at those core pinnacles and the way in which we're designing schools and the way in which we're valuing our students and valuing our students' minds, then I think then we can start to have further conversations about discipline and the way in which we discipline and the way in which, you know, I think correct, a lot of those things will self start to self-correct because students will actually be valued in that place and dignified in a place where they're not acting out um, and not doing stupid stuff for the tension or for the modes of being suspended and going home. Thank you. Uh, James Davis, uh, Chairman, Black Parents Workshop, South Orange Maplewood School District. All that is correct. I want to add one element to it, which is uh, I've heard people talk about teachers suspending principals and others. Uh, the one common denominator for all those groups that are able to suspend students is that they have a high amount of discretion in their decision making. That can be corrected by policy if you do it the right way. And that's one of the things that we tried to do in our lawsuit against the district was to one, make it more transparent. What was happening before a student gets suspended? How many students are getting suspended? And then the code of conduct, which we help revise, is more layered now with respect to before you get to that decision, what was the infraction? 
Has it been recorded? Who's making the decisions for that student suspension? Because there are certain times, there are certain activities which require suspension based upon state law, but it's a very small number. It gets, you know, criminal activity, basically. Um, once you start to identify those issues in your own school district, you can start to revise those documents, which I think if we all went to our school districts right now and looked at the policies, they're probably very antiquated. Because people, especially parents, assume they're up to date, assume they're doing things the right way, and it wasn't until we decided to take a deeper look, we saw a lot of opportunities to change that. And unfortunately, <laughs> we tried to do it without filing a lawsuit, but we got a lot of pushback and, and stagnation, so we felt like in order to hold the district accountable, we had to take this other step. Not to say that every district has to do that, but as you think about how to change your school district respectively, think about the different types of ways you can do it because it doesn't have to be a lawsuit, but ultimately that's how our forebears did it. I think I saw in some studies that uh, some states make, make uh, suspending preschool students illegal. So there, to your point, there are policy measures that we can take. Um, so good morning, afternoon, uh, good afternoon. Um, so the, the piece is about like, sorry, my name is Aliyah Berry. I'm a community-based social worker, um, former special education teacher, school social worker, behaviorist. So that's kind of my lens here. Um, just the pieces about like, there's a lot of policy pieces of this, this discussion that I hear so far in regards to training, in regards to the infractions um, that you know, the schools are suspending for um, the training of staff, just like these macro level policy things. And so sometimes <laughs> full transparency, I get super overwhelmed, right? By like the macro level conversations because they can feel very overwhelming. And so like, then I resort to the in the meantime because until the overhaul happens, like, you know, young people are really being harmed by <laughs> this, by these things that we're discussing here today. Um, and so I think my question, two kind of comments that I would want to contribute to the notes here today is number one, investing in the healing infrastructure within the school, right? Because the, the young people that are often um, being suspended and then ultimately pushed out as the data shows, um, they sometimes are the, the outliers of the ones that are struggling the most with trauma. Um, and so like building healing into the infrastructure of the school, here I go talking about a macro level thing, but investment and training, like that doesn't take much to put healing into the schools. And the second piece is, um, Again, reinventing the wheel, right? So about four or five years ago, Opportunity Youth Network had a restorative center. <laughs> and me and Mitty, we were a part of it. And like, we were doing intensive counseling and psychotherapeutic groups with suspended students who are suspended more than 25 days. They were doing art-based restorative projects following the counseling and then did uh, integrative meetings with the schools to be able to restore the harm that occurred and come back into the school. Um, I think we found a lot of the behaviors, one, the infractions were triggering to the student that's number one, like the security guard's response triggered the student's trauma, which manifested into the behavior that the student ultimately got suspended for, right? So now we need to like dive deep into, you know, healing the student, um, but just healing that, that relationship. But I say all that to say that like, the, I, don't, I don't know where the students are going currently um, within North Public Schools, but like we've done things in this, in this district that work and that have data and that like, so I wanna put in the notes, where did the restorative center go? Yeah, like, and can we bring that model back? That's, yeah. I think we've got negative two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, the next session starts at 12.40. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Javon Sylvester. I'm the program manager with North Street Academy. Um, that gentleman over there is actually my supervisor, so I had to give him the look to make sure <laughs> I'm free to speak um, transparently. But 
Um, not to offend anybody, but I do think that there's another element of this that we're forgetting to look at, um, which is from the educator's uh, perspective, to where there's not enough support on the social emotional level for teachers. Um, and we do not take into consideration when teachers, administrators, guidance counselors, even principals, they get burnt out from having to be a mother, a father, a mentor, a aunt, a sister, a uncle, a, you know, a, a, a baby father, a baby mother, um, come out of their own pockets for these, these students or they're overwhelmed to teach for these students. And before I can even get to my lesson, I have to spend 10, 15 minutes with a student that's coming in and because of these traumas that's going on, it takes us 15 minutes just to get to the root of them being able to say good morning, pull out a pencil, why are you unprepared? So what happens then when I'm that teacher, I'm completely burnt out. This is what I have to deal with on a day to day basis. Nobody is supporting me. And now I'm to the point where the only option I have left is please remove this young man from my class. Not that I don't see the potential, not that I don't want him to succeed, not that I don't believe that he can, uh, he's intelligent or lack thereof, but I'm burnt out. I'm dealing with this every day and nobody is here to support me with these other needs. And teachers do go through that. And sometimes the option is, okay, I just need this child removed because I'm burnt out and there's no support in that area. And I do think that's a crucial element to a lot of um, teachers and administrators in our school. We don't take that into consideration. And me being an educator myself, I go through that. We deal with the population of students between the ages of 16 to 24 that have unfortunately been kicked out of school or they've been dropped out of school. And that's a different level of energy. I think the expectation on teachers are for them to be superheroes and we don't expect for them to get burnt out or their feelings to get hurt or for them to get sad or for them to go through depression. The same traumas that a lot of these students go through as well. So as my supervisor always says to us, who heals the healers? And when we have that lack of support, you're expecting for me to pour 100% of myself into 40 students and that nobody's pouring into me. I'm very sorry to cut it off, but if we have to cut it off, I, I'm glad we ended with a comment that said, let's not pit one party against the other. It's, it's not. The schools are alienating for everybody. And what everybody does is take it out on everybody else, right? Uh, and, and, and so to solve the problem for students, we need to solve it for the adults around them, right? So I think that, if nothing else, and I, I want to thank the, the two of you from the Newark Street team about being very clear and explicit. There are problems in the home, too, right? Um, and without blaming anybody or looking down on anybody, we have to open up a broader space than we've had for talking about those problems, right? Because we are often very reluctant to say that, right? Uh, so I appreciate folk putting that on, on the table. And I think my talk, Dr. Riley, will sort of be another opportunity to think about what would happen if you centered dignity, if you started with that, right? Um, no, there's so much else I want to comment on, but then you won't get lunch. <laughs> and, and I won't be ready to give you your lunch talk. <laughs> so, thanks. thanks. For lunch. You'll hear more from Did you, do you want to make one final? Yes, I would. Go ahead. And this, and this will end it. We'll close uh, it. My name is Elisa Charters. I'm a trustee here at NJIT. I was a first gen to go to college. Um, I dealt with a lot of these issues that were talked about here. Um, but this is such a rich conversation. I just want to say I would love to try to support ongoing conversations, not just here today, this day, but ongoing conversations. And I will uh, talk to the administrators who put this together to see if we can do maybe an interim meetup to continue these very, very vital conversations. I'm glad you said that. Um, I know that, 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 that uh, Dr. Brown from the mayor's office who sort of headed the planning wants to start having a series of what do we do next kind of discussion. So anybody who, who has ideas about that, if you don't have, you know, you can give them to her, you can give them to me. I, I, I was on the planning committee. Um, but there's lots of, of concern with not making this a one-day conversation, okay. two-day conversation. All right, go get lunch. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. Thank you.